Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we complete our look back at the greenhouse project we did several years ago. After it was constructed, the greenhouse sat just outside the shop, right in this location. Sadly, it was never used for plants. And eventually we needed some space for the storage shed, which you see here now. The original greenhouse was disassembled and trucked to a new location where I'm happy to report it is used by a passionate gardener every day from early spring to late fall. It has sheltered thousands of seedlings, hundreds of cuttings, dozens of display plants, and can be reliably counted on to produce the first tomato of summer every year. The owner wouldn't part with it for all the tea in China. Of course, sometimes he wishes that it was much, much bigger. But then again, I don't know a keen gardener who doesn't long for more space to satisfy his plant growing addiction. Now, let's return to part two of the greenhouse program to see the final assembly and the rest of the accessories like doors, venting, windows, and the benches. That's next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Before I can install the remaining trusses that hold the sidewalls, form the roof, and hold the glazing, I'm making a notch right at the peak to receive the ridge cap because I want it to be flush with the top of the rafter and to hold down the glazing. Now, if you choose to build the greenhouse, a plan will be available with all these details and a materials list. You'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, let's build that ridge cap. With one side of the ridge cap clamped in my side vise to hold it, I'll be able to set the other side on top. Now, the whole idea of a ridge cap is to cover the roofing materials where they meet at the peak. And in order to have each side of the ridge cap equal, it's necessary to rip one piece so that it's narrower than the other by the thickness of the board. Now, I'm going to secure these pieces together with some screws. But before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now a bead of caulking along the inside edge is not going to hurt. Sequence is very important at this point of the assembly. I'm stacking in the three trusses on one end of the greenhouse, and now I'm going to take the purlins and slide them into the upper triangle. Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to get them in. I'll just let them set on the side for now. Then I can take each truss and work them down the line for the final installation. Now, if this greenhouse was going to stay here permanently, I would apply some glue to this joint. But because we want to move it later, we're going to assemble it dry and secure everything with some screws. OK, that takes care of number one. Let's slide in the second one. Well, now the third one. You can imagine what kind of mess I might have gotten into if I hadn't put these purlins up here first. A screw through a pre-drilled hole in the top of each truss secures it to the top plate. Now, the next step is to slip the purlins into place notches slide in over the rafters and secure those with some screws.
With the purlin secure, I can now install the ridge cap. And that'll get a screw on each side of each rafter. Even on a cool day, this greenhouse is going to get pretty hot inside. So I'm going to install two roof vents, one right through the opening I'm standing in now and one over on this side. In order to do that, I'm going to have to add a couple pieces on top of the purlin to secure the fixed glazing down below. I've just taken a piece of one by stock and ripped it at a 45 degree angle. And this will be a stop to secure the glazing at the eave line. The next step is to make a rabbit at the square edge to receive the glazing. This is one of two cuts I'll need to make for a groove that'll allow any condensation that builds up in the roof panels to escape. With a guide block temporarily secured to my fence, which is cut at a 45 degree angle, I'm able to hold the strip in the right position to complete the leaf hole. The last operation on this piece is to make a notch at each rafter tail location. Well, now I'm ready for the roof panels. We're using some more of that polycarbonate double wall panel. The manufacturer supplies a foil tape to cover the ends at the top, so nothing can get inside the voids. We'll just slide it in the grooves that I made in the rafters, making sure that the blue film faces the outside, because that's where the UV protector is. Now, at the bottom of each piece, we have a different situation. I install a fabric tape supplied by the manufacturer. Keeps the dirt out, yet it lets the moisture escape so that it can fall through those weep holes we made in the edge strip. Notice that I've installed a spacer block at the top of the purlin, and that's to hold the panel away from the purlin, because if moisture builds up on the inside, we want it to go right by, not drip on you. Okay, that's the last panel on this side. Now for the eave strip. It will take a little fussing to get it into the exact position, but once it's there, I'll secure it with a few screws. There's a couple more things I have to do to complete these panels. The first is to pry each panel up about a sixteenth of an inch from the rabbet so that any water that comes out of the panel can run down the rabbet and they'll go out through the weep holes. The second thing is to secure the panel. Wood holds it down on three sides. I'm afraid if I don't put something at the bottom it's going to buckle, but I have to have the water run off. So I've selected the thinnest material I could find, this thin aluminum, and I'm going to secure these strips with a few screws. Of course, the screws that I'm using are rust resistant. Now, some water could run underneath the aluminum channel, so I'm just running a small bead of caulking, a special caulking supplied by the manufacturer to be used with these polycarbonates. Now, all we have to do is peel off the film.
Well, that takes care of everything on the outside of the roof. There's one more thing to do on the inside. They have to install a block under the ridge to keep the glazing from sagging. The top edge of the blocks that I'm using at the ridge have been beveled at 45 degrees on each side. They just slip between the trusses against the glazing and are secured in place with a couple screws. Now here are all the parts for the various pieces. This set here is the rail and style set for the door. This is two rail and style sets for the roof windows, and this is a set for the window on the gable end. The first thing I'm doing is running a groove, which will receive the glazing and tenons to join the pieces together. I'm using my stack dado head cutter, a little bit wider than 5 16 of an inch. I'll run the piece through, turn it around, run the other edge, and that assures me that the groove is centered. Now here's a window frame, and I'm just dry fitting it together. You can see that I've formed a tenon on the rail that fits into the groove of the style. Now the roof windows will be made the same way. And the door, and let's review how you make those tenons. I've set up a gauge block, set the height of the saw so that it cuts just to the groove, and set the distance to make the shoulder cut on the tenon, which I make first by using my miter gauge to guide the piece through. Now I'll just slide the fence out of the way, take the piece that I just made the shoulder cuts on, and eyeball the blade, raising it until it meets the cut I just made. Now to make the cheek cuts on the tenon, I'm going to use my tenoning jig, which rides in the miter slot, and it has a clamp to hold the piece safely as I run it through. Here's one of the frames for the roof vents, dry fitted together. And the glazing is going to sit in the side pieces and in the top, but down here at the bottom, I don't want to have the water hang up. I want it to roll off. So I'm going to have to remove the outer portion of the rail. This is the center rail for the door. Condensation could form here. These weep holes should help. The glazing is next, and to cut this polycarbonate, I've installed my fine tooth laminate cutting saw. Just as I did with the panels on the greenhouse, I want to seal the top edge of each panel with this foil tape. Now, I found that if I use a small piece of dowel to press it into place. It eliminates any wrinkles which make it difficult to slide into the slot. And at the bottom of every panel, the fabric tape that breathes. And now for some more of our high-tech glue. I apply the glue to one surface. I've pre-moistened the other surface. And I just slip them together. This is a moisture-cured product, so it takes moisture from the air or the moisture I've added to the joint to cure. And you'll be surprised that it will foam up out of the joints. But you can grind it off easily after it cures. With the rails glued to one side of the door, I can slip in my glazing panels. Depending on the humidity and the temperature, the open time for this glue is between 30 minutes and 4 hours. And after I put it together, I should keep it clamped for about 24 hours. OK, that's good. Before I quit tonight, I want to glue up the window and the two roof vents. And I'll see you back here first thing tomorrow. I'm getting started this morning drilling the through holes in the aluminum which will secure the glazing in our roof windows. The first hole is a 5 30 seconds through hole. Next, I'll countersink for the screw head. Just as we did with the roof panels, I'm securing the piece with some rust resistant screws. 
This is the outside of the roof vent, and this is the bottom, so the water can flow right off. My roof vents are going to pivot on some butt hinges. And I'm going to use an automatic opener, so I want hinges that are not going to stick. So I've chosen hot dip galvanized hinges with brass pins. I'm going to make sure I keep these lubricated. I'm mortising the hinge into the roof window. And the mortise is a little bit deeper than I need because I'm going to surface mount the hinge to the ridge. And I want to have as small a gap as possible between the window and the rafters so that the building is watertight. Now here is how I set up for each hinge. I hold it on the edge, align it, take a sharp utility knife, and score the outline of the hinge. I'm going to remove the majority of material for the mortise with my router and a half inch mortising bit. And then I'll clean up the rest with a good sharp chisel. This redwood is so soft cuts easily with a good sharp chisel. More rust resistant screws to secure the hinge to the unit. Find it a little bit easier if I take the hinges apart and then attach the leaf to the ridge. Now all I have to do is slide the unit in and secure it with the pins. Okay, let's put the other one in. We picked up the opener for our roof vent at our greenhouse supply center. Inside this tube, there's a heat sensitive material. As the greenhouse heats up, it pushes this end of the tube out, and there's plenty of leverage in this arm to open the window through the rod. As the temperature in the greenhouse cools down, it automatically closes. The installation is pretty simple. I've attached the clip to the window. The mechanism will be attached to the purlin with a couple screws, and then we'll hook it all together with the rod. That's all there is to it. The temperature variation will do the rest. Here's the sash for our awning window, assembled the same way as the door and our roof windows. I've already mortised the top rail for the hinges that will pivot the window. Now I've set up my stacked dado head cutter with a sacrificial strip to make a rabbit along each edge. I'll show you what those are for in a minute. At the window opening, the hinges are simply applied to the underside of the frame. These thin strips are going to slide into the slots that are in the studs, and they will act as stops against which the rabbit will rest. OK, now I can set the sash in place, slip the hinges together, and Drive the pins, give it a try. Okay, that works good. Now all I gotta do is find out a way to hold it open and hold it closed. There's one more piece I wanna apply to the window here in the shop. It's this sill piece, cut at a 10 degree angle and a saw curve placed in the front edge to let the water drip away. I'm going to install it so it overhangs the sash about a half inch, and that'll allow it to close against the frame. A bead of caulking on the inside edge, and I'll attach it with a few screws. One more piece out here at the greenhouse, a piece that's going to act like a drip cap to shed the water away from the window. The angle that it's cut at is 10 degrees. Uh, 
All right. Well, that should keep most of the elements out. Now we're ready to hang the door. And I suppose most woodworkers would mortise for the hinges, just like I did on the window and the roof vents. But I happen to have a door mortising jig. Now, the jig will accept all different sized doors and hinges. I've set it up today for a 3-inch hinge and a 6-6 six -six door. The first thing to do is to slide the jig up to the top of the door and set the gap I want between the door and the frame. In this case, an eighth of an inch. Then, by tapping down on these pins, I can secure the jig to the door. Now, there are three jigs, one for each hinge, connected by bars. To remove the material for the mortise, I'm using a collar supplied by the manufacturer and a 5 8 inch morticing bit. The collar just rides around inside the jig. It works great. Now I just pop the jig off. And the last thing that I have to do to the mortises is square up the corners because the router leaves a rounded corner. Using this square chisel makes fast work out of squaring up each corner. Now we'll take the same jig and mortise the frame out at the greenhouse. Now's a good time to remove the sill plate from the doorway. Well, there's the jig set up on the door, and you can clearly see the advantage. Without moving anything, I know that all my mortises are going to line up. Now I just route them out the same way. The next thing I want to do is bevel the latch edge of the door so that as it closes, it won't hit the frame. It's something you do to all doors. In the old days, they used to do it with jack planes. Today, we use power tools. I'm going to use my power plane, which is set up with a single cutter. Also has a guide fence, which I've tipped in five degrees to give me the bevel I want. A couple passes along the edge should take care of it. OK, let's see how it fits. That jig never makes a mistake. Now let's see if it clears OK. That's good. Now it's time to build some benches. For the top of our bench, I'm going to use some 1 by 4 cedar. I've cut the pieces so that they'll overhang the front by about 3 quarters of an inch. I'm going to leave plenty of gap between the boards. So I've made a 5 8 inch spacer. And that will give me plenty of room for the drainage when I water the plants. To install the benches, I've set up a few temporary support sticks. Now I just got to slide the bench into position. Then I'll crawl underneath and attach it to the studs with some screws. Here I have a storm and screen door latch, and that should be plenty for what we need here. These one inch wide strips of cedar will act as stops for the door. I'm going to let them hang in the opening a half inch, and I'll secure them with some four penny finish nails. Hey, we're ready for the plants. That was a good project. Now, next time, we're going to build a project I've been wanting to do for a long time. One of the fireplaces in my new house needs a mantle. So next time, we'll build one right here in the New Yankee Workshop.
home video or a measured drawing of the project you've just seen, please call 866-545-9708. Additional information is available at newyankee.com.